Sounded good today. Love it. Very good. Welcome. You can have a seat. It is so good to have you here this morning worshiping with us. If you're worshiping on the web, that's wonderful. Wherever you're at, glad to have you here. My name's Jeff Hanna, the associate pastor, and uh, we're just glad that you're here. Uh, we want to welcome you, and if you're visiting, we want you to fill out the flap. It's on the back of the seat there. Fill that out. Make sure you take it to the Welcome Center, and we will get you a nice gift. That, and we're just to show that we're happy you're here. So we hope you can do that. Uh, if you haven't seen the announcement loop, we uh, have one. There's a pig right there. Okay, hold on just a second. Sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm giving the announcements. I will. Nancy, I will. Okay, all right. She wanted me to remind you, if you have cell phones, to please turn them off during worship. <laughs> Seriously, we, we know that that's, uh, sometimes we forget. So please turn off your cell phones. It's not only distracting to those around you, but also to uh, whoever's up front speaking or singing or whatever. So please, if you would, that would be a wonderful gift you could give us all. The rose, you see a rose over on the communion table over there. And it is here to give a warm welcome to little Bailey Marie Thomas, born on February 25th to Jordan Martell and Chad Thomas. Loving grandparents are Stacy and Steve Hornish. And we're praying for y'all. It's wonderful. Glad. Very good. Today at the end of worship and moving forward at the end of every worship, we're going to have a thing called the men's huddle. If you're a father, grandfather, you help care for a child, whatever, or even if you're just a man and want to have some conversation with your significant other, uh, we want you to join us for five minutes or less right at the front here immediately after worship. We hope you'll come up. We'll give you something to take away and, and have some conversation, and we think that's going to be a really helpful thing for a lot of folks. So... Anyway, have you ever noticed that Jesus sometimes said some things that you wish he didn't say? Maybe it's just me, but, but that happens. And we're going to do a series on those. They're hard to take, but they're absolutely important and necessary that we hear what Jesus had to say. So that's our series coming up, and we're excited about that. But we're going to continue to worship, so if you would stand. If you feel led, uh, the altar is open this morning. Go ahead and stand up. The altar is open this morning, and we hope that you'll uh, use that if you feel the need. Thanks.
compared to Calvary, but nevertheless, we lay them at your feet. Such a tiny You know, in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 2, it says to uh, be in great joy in the times of your trials and your tribulations. I guess that's a scripture that's sometimes hard to understand. But there's one thing that God does for us all the time, and especially when we're in the midst of troubles and trials. There are three things that we get that are absolutely free. And there are the three things that we should probably focus on more than anything else, especially then, but even even in times of of plenty. You know, security is something that everybody wants. And in times of economic downturn, sometimes it's a little tough to feel secure. But in that security, security that God gives us, He shows us that He has also given us acceptance. He accepts us for who we are and where we are. He also tells us that we are significant. We are more significant than the sands of the desert and the the beaches. And he knows each grain of sand. So just think of how he must feel about us. So let's pray and let's be grateful for those things that are just out there free. Then all we have to do is let them wash over us. Lord, wow, we just, we just stand in awe of who you are. We praise you. We worship you. This is a time when we should focus on you. This is a time that you ask us to seriously focus on you, to uh, give us your attention. Lord, there are so many things in this world that cause us to grieve, Absolutely not the least of which is uh, the things that we wish Jesus didn't say. But we know that he did. And we have to live with that. And we have to focus on trying to become more like him. That's what sanctification means. Just grow into him. Let him grow into you. Father God, you have just... You have just overwhelmed us with, with really joy in spite of the weather. You probably did that to slow us down a little bit more. We thank you that we do have the seasons. We thank you that, that we have life. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you give so freely. You gave us your son. And in this upcoming Lenten season, help us, Lord, to focus even more on the cross and what it represents and and what it means to have Jesus in our hearts as a part of our lives as we go through our daily walk. Help us, Lord, to not only talk the talk, 
but help us to walk the walk. Give us strength. Right now, I just ask that you would be with Pastor Brenda as she brings your message for our ears and our hearts. Help us to focus on that and to uh, take to heart everything that, that, you have, that you have laid on her heart to impart to us. And we will be careful to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I sound good, I smell good, and I look good. Just when you think you've had enough of me, I draw you back in. Think you can break free from me? Don't be so sure. I insist. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. You have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye even your good eye causes you to lust, gouge it out, and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Oh, honey child, no, he did not. Oh, no, he did it with Myrtle May. Jesus said some crazy things back in his time. Things like, if you if you staring at that junk in the truck, you poke your eye out. What? 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 what, what you, you, you don't believe this? You think this is, this is nonsense? What? What, were you dropped on your head as a child, girl? What? Cross that solid gold. You know what? I'm gonna poke your eye out. You said to talk to you look at me like that guy. Kind of attitude. I'll tell you all about it. Have a problem keeping your hands off other people's property? Well, Jesus said, cut them off. I'm here to testify. It's true. Cut them off. What's the matter with you taking stuff that doesn't belong to you? Make no sense. What are you laughing at? Uh, what do you think is so funny? You think this is a joke? Huh? Huh? Oh, you laughing at little miss thing, huh? I know you got that hate for that girl at work there. You know what Jesus says about that? You're a murderer! Carrying that type of hate, you may as well kill the girl! You think you funny? What, you think this is a joke? You think, oh no, Jesus didn't? Well, let me tell you. Oh, yes, he did. Oh, no, he did it with Myrtle May. <laughs> okay, work with me here a minute. I want you to close your eyes. Okay, close your eyes. Now, not to pray. Not to pray. We're going to do something else. I need you to close your eyes, and I want you to transport yourself in your mind to your favorite vacation place. Maybe you've been there, maybe you haven't, but you'd sure like to go. Maybe it's the mountains. Can you feel the stretch in your tendons, and can you smell the mountain scent, the fir trees? You got all that going on? Smell it. Or maybe it's the beach. Maybe you can hear the roar of the waves and you can feel that ocean spray on your face. Or maybe it's Cedar Point and you can feel that anticipation in the pit of your stomach as you're getting ready to hit that roller coaster. Tell somebody beside you where you've just been, okay? Tell someone your vacation place. Come on, work with me here. Get talking. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, now let's do another one. <clears throat> let's do another one. What I want you to do right now is think with me and go in your head back to the house that you lived in most of your growing up years. Some of you moved a lot and you might have only had two or three years, but, but pick a place and go back there in your mind. Close your eyes and go back there again. You got it? You might even remember what it smelled like. Remember what it was like when you got around the dinner table? Maybe you did that every night, maybe just on occasions, but remember that. Do you remember what the meal was maybe you had most often? Maybe macaroni and cheese and hot dogs. Remember that? Hmm. Okay. You can look at me now. Isn't the mind an amazing thing? See, God has created our mind in such a way that we can travel to amazing places. We can do amazing things without leaving our seat. We can do all different kinds of things. We can... We can Go places, think things, be people, do things. Like right now, some of you are still on the beach. You haven't returned to the service yet. Some of you might be shopping. Some of you might be doing dishes. Some of you might be planning the summer. And some of you might be doing something that you're really glad that none of us knows you're doing. See, the mind is an amazing thing. God created it that way, and we can commission our mind. We can send our minds on a journey. We can tell our minds to do something honorable and wonderful, or we can use our minds, that powerful capacity that we have to go places, do things, make worlds in our mind. We can use it to do something incredibly dishonorable, too. It just depends. And when we do it, we can do it without giving a single hint of where we've gone. We don't even need to twitch a face, facial muscle. The teacher, the preacher, the mom, dad, the boss can think you're sitting there wonderfully listening, hanging on every word, and you're not even in the room. You know how it works, right? That's the way it works. Now, Jesus shocked everybody when in the middle of a situation like that, on a hillside, one afternoon, in the middle of a sermon that we know is a Sermon on the Mount, it's found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we, we read it there. In the middle of that sermon, he dropped some shocking thoughts. He dropped some shocking thoughts, some outrageous thoughts into the middle of this sermon that he was preaching because he understood people's minds. Now, my kids accuse me all the time of being incredibly distractible, and I actually pretty much am. You know, I can get distracted, and, you know, I can be, I can be telling you something very, very serious. I, I could be in the middle of, of telling you, you know, about someone's health condition, and all of a sudden I'll say, did you get new glasses? <laughs> and they go like, whoops, a bird. You know, it's just kind of like, you know, one of those people who notice everything going on and they get distracted real easy. So they'll always kid me about that. I think people must have thought that about Jesus when he was preaching. Because he had just been, he had just finished gone, going through a long and wonderful and inspiring list about what makes you blessed. Blessed are you, happy are you. When your heart is pure, blessed are you, happy are, are you when you mourn because people will comfort you. He goes through a whole list of stuff like that. And then all of a sudden it's one of those, oh, it's a bird moments. Because he lobs a grenade into the crowd that is totally different than anything they expected. He throws some thoughts in there that they never expected. Now remember, I'm going to tell you what he said in our language as if we were saying it today. If Jesus were standing right here in person, instead of on that hillside, how would his language change? What would he say? Well, he would look into this crowd and he would say, Huh, you know what just occurred to me? Some of you are feeling pretty superior, uh, superior about yourselves. Because you've never been arrested for domestic violence. You've never assaulted anybody. You've never murdered anybody. And you're feeling pretty doggone good about yourselves. You say, what a great person I am. I'm not like that trash 
that we see arrested in the paper. That's why I love to buy those busted magazines because I love to see the people who are worse than me, the people in our county who got picked up and arrested. But let me tell you, friends, sin is an inside deal. Sin is primarily an inside deal. So let me just tell you what. You may not have done that, but here's what I'm telling you. I hear you call that guy the N-word in your head. I hear you drop the F-bomb. I hear you call your wife or your boss the B-word, maybe to their face or behind their back. I hear it. I hear it. I see it. I see your anger. I know how you go off on people when you've got the courage and when you're the most powerful person in a situation. I hear you go off on people and say these terrible things. I hear you call people rednecks. I hear you use foul words that stereotype and put people in places. I hear you curse. I hear you do that, even if you don't have the courage enough to do it out loud, even if you do it in your head. I hear it. And here's what I want to tell you. Sin is an inside deal. There are a million ways to kill a guy. You can do it with your hands. You can do it with a gun. Or you can do it with your hatred. You can kill a person with your words and with your thoughts. You can do it. Get off your high horse. Quit thinking just because you haven't been arrested for something. You've never been hauled downtown. Quit thinking you're so superior. That F-bomb, destructive to the hilt. That name you called, murder. You, my friend, are in danger of hellfire. Get over yourself. Wow. Can you imagine the reaction of the people that day? Kind of like yours. Kind of like yours. You can see it. The husband, the, the wife's hoping her husband doesn't elbow her where anyone can see. She's hoping that nobody sees her kids craning their necks to go. You know. They're all worried. Because Jesus has lobbed a hand grenade into the middle of the crowd. And all the people who came in feeling good about themselves have a new standard. He's made it all cattywampus. It's all different. And then he doesn't stop there. He did it again. As if they weren't shell-shocked enough, he said, look, some more of you feeling pretty good about yourself because you've never committed adultery. That means that you haven't slept in the wrong bed with the wrong person. And you're feeling pretty good about that. But let me tell you what I know. I know that a whole bunch of you are bed hopping in your mind. I know that that's what's going on with you. I know that beneath the exterior where you're just smiling and looking good and holy, I know that there's some incredible stuff going in here. Sin is primarily an inside deal. True story, Jesus says. True story. It's an inside deal. You've got an X-rated movie going on in your mind starring you and someone who doesn't even know you're thinking about them. And I'm telling you, I won't have it. I'm looking for people who are pure at heart. I'm building a new generation of followers of me who have clean hands and clean hearts. That's what I'm building. I'm not going to have it. Jesus would say, you can sit in the middle of a church service and com commit adultery. You can do it just as surely as you could do it with your whole body in a hotel room. You can sit right here and do it. And you won't even twitch a muscle. No one will know the difference. But I know it. I'm looking for people who are clean at heart. Oh, yeah. See, I can see their faces right now. Because if you're not a public speaker, you may not be aware of this. But when I'm giving the message, you are giving messages too. 
And I see some of you. Some of you, you're giving me the message pretty early on in a service. You got about three minutes to get this good or I'm going to the cafe and getting coffee. I see that message. I'm not stupid. I know it. And so what I do in the back of my head, I put it on the back burner and I'm like, I'll give them six. They'll be gone in six. I know it. I see other faces that are leaning forward and they're looking very expectantly. It's kind of like they're thinking, pour that wisdom on me, baby. I'm ready for it. And because I'm 58, I'm old enough to not believe that that tells me a true story all the time either. I know you may have learned to look really good while you're at the beach, you know. And then there are some people who honestly come with open enough hearts and willingness to hear that they're vulnerable. And when I say something and God says it to their hearts, their faces begin to show it. It's like, ouch. Or maybe some tears or maybe some joy. I guarantee you, Jesus, with his ability to be far more than human, he knew what was going on that day. He was reading their faces. He saw amazing stuff on that day. Now, why did Jesus go there? Why did he leave his nicely prepared sermon with all the points about what you do to be blessed? Why did he go there? Why did he shock them like this? Why did he say the things that he said? And when he said the the King James says, if you call someone you fool, that was a very, very bad word back in those days. The Bible said don't say it. It was the equivalent of the kind of stuff that we say today that no godly person should ever say. Why did he do that? Because, again, Jesus wanted to drive home the point that sin is primarily an inside deal. It starts in the heart. It starts right here. And it is so terribly dangerous when it starts in your heart. It eventually changes everything. Sin changes your relationship with God. Listen to this. Isaiah 59, 2. This is just one of many places that says this just in, in different words. It says, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Don't be foolish and try to tell me that because you've been saved, you're saved forever. And you can say and do and think anything you want to and you're safe with God. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. That was man's idea. That's not God's idea. Read the Bible. Read all of it. Don't just read those little verses you pull out. Your sins have separated you from your God. Who's God? Someone that once had a relationship with God. Your sins have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. Don't cuss your wife out and then go pray and think God is going to hear you. He's saying, la da 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 da, keep talking, don't hear you. That's what he says. Don't think you can have that hatred. Don't think you can carry on these X-rated movies in your mind and be heard by God because he says, no, your sin that starts in your heart changes everything. It changes your relationship with God. Don't get mad at me. Jesus said it. It's him. Put it right back there. Your security, your prayer life, your fellowship, your confidence, everything is changed when you let this sin that starts on the inside run unchecked. Jesus said it. Changes your relationship with God. You know what else it does? It changes your relationship with others. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Inside sin affects the way you view people. You can't be angry at someone. You can be angry at someone and fake it for a while. But you can't be angry at someone and have a healthy relationship with them. You can't, you can't be thinking those things inside of there. You can't be doing it. If you don't remember, if you don't believe me, think about last Thanksgiving. How natural did you feel around those people that you just couldn't stand? Not very good. Sin changes your relationship with others. The Bible says that we are all created in the image of God. But when I am sinning with my mind, even though no one else knows it, I am not thinking the way God thinks. And it changes my relationship with people. Think about this. She's your son's third grade teacher. And the first time you see her, you think, hot. 
Okay. You're a man. It's a natural reaction. You can think that way for a minute. It's a natural reaction because you have eyes. But at that point in time, you have a choice. Am I going to let my mind run this way and objectify her and think about her as a piece of flesh, someone who's hot or not? Am I going to let it go that way? If I do, I lose the picture of her as a multidimensional creation of God. A person who may be good to look at, which is nice, but a person with a soul that will live forever. When I think about her in that way, and I just let my mind run there, I lose the ability to think that she is a person who either has a relationship with God or does not, a person who will live forever somewhere, a person who has a family, maybe children of her own, a person who has a father, a person who has a mother, a person who has perhaps a spouse. I lose all of that. I quit thinking about her as an intelligent person who has something to contribute to this world. I quit thinking about her as a person who has heartaches and needs. Because I've said, hot. And I've let my mind begin to build a kingdom of sin. And do you know what it does? It changes my relationship with her. I can't have the healthy relationship that a parent should have between themselves and a child's teacher who spends six or seven hours a day with them. And I may end up changing my relationship with my wife when she figures it out. See, change, it it changes my relationship with, with people. When I'm angry, when I'm lustful, when I'm jealous, all of those things that start in the heart. Jesus says, hey, sin is primarily an inside deal, and I'm telling you this because it's so dangerous. It not only changes your relationship with me, but it changes your relationship with people. Anger that sees on the inside is the underlying root to many a broken relationship, many an ended career, many a bad situation. And without question, it makes authentic relationships possible, as does jealousy, envy, greed, all those inside sins that we hide, that we can sit there and put the glaze over our face and nobody knows. But we can't be close to people when we feel that way about them. Sin changes your relationship with the world, too. The people outside of the kingdom of faith. It changes your relationship with them. Jesus knew it. And the whole reason he doesn't take us to heaven the minute we get saved, before we have a chance to screw up, is because we are supposed to be here being salt and light in the world. And when I have sin on the inside, people may never know what it is, but there's just something about it just something about you. You're a little bit creepy. You're a little bit tense. You're a little bit judgmental. You're a little bit something. And people pick up on it because we are spiritual and relational creatures and we're a lot smarter than we give each other credit for. We know something's not quite clicking. And then you know what happens? When sin stays on the inside for a long enough time, it begins to seep out in a variety of ways. And when that happens, the world's taste for Christianity, the world's taste for a relationship with Jesus, is destroyed. You lose your cool at work? Boy, unless you get humble and you come back in there and you start repenting big time and you say, this is my fault, I'm so sorry, this is what I did, Please don't ever tell them you're a Christian. And if you have to have that stupid bumper sticker on your car, please don't tell anyone you go to Cornerstone Church when they ask about it. Because when you get out there and you curse and you swear and you let your anger explode, you ruin the name of Jesus Christ and all of our names in the world. You believe this? Britney Spears... And Miley Cyrus started as Sunday school girls. They got their exposure to singing just like Megan did this morning on the platform of their church with their loyal, devoted Christian parents sitting 
in the pews. What happened? Sin is an inside deal. Sin is an inside deal. And as their parents changed and they kept allowing their daughters to be exposed to more and more and they were okay with it and they made an excuse for this, it just kind of makes you wonder what was going on in daddy's head, doesn't it? Kind of makes you wonder what's going on in mommy's head. And then we got it in the heads of the girls. And now their Sunday school roots are the fodder for late night talk show jokes. Just like Katy Perry. Same thing, preacher's kid. And here she is. See, sin's an inside deal, but it doesn't stay there. If it only stayed there, then you'd just go to hell. And we could say, it's what you deserve. See ya. Hell. But when sin stays inside long enough, it creeps out in a million ways. And it destroys lots and lots of people. You've been reading anything Billy Cyrus has said? Billy Cyrus says if he could go back and take it all back and do it all over again, he would give up all the fame, all the glory, everything to have his family back and to have the innocence of his daughter back. He'd give it all. Hmm. That's why Jesus talked about it. It's really dangerous. Sin changes your relationship with yourself. Changes your relationship with yourself. Aren't we miserable people to live with when we're hiding something? When we got a secret we can't let anybody know? We're miserable and we're always accusing other people of being touchy, right? Have you ever noticed when you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, you think everybody else in the world is a pain? You think, man, are they grumpy. (laughs) We just think that way. When you've got a secret... When you don't respect yourself, and you don't respect yourself, now here's the thing. You say, oh, yes, I do. No, you don't. You don't respect yourself. You defend yourself. You defend yourself because you don't want to change, but respect is a totally different thing. When you know that there's sin in your heart, this inside deal, when you know that you are lusting, when you know that you're full of seething anger, and you do and say things that you wouldn't want the world to know, when you're jealous, when you've got all these inside things going on, when that's happening, you do not respect yourself. You don't. And come on, I've been there and you have too. You've prayed with someone. Or you've told someone, I will pray for you. Or someone says to you, man, I so admire your life. And inside you're going. You've been there. If you haven't, your conscience is probably so seared there's very little hope for you. Because you don't realize the gap that can easily be made between God's standard for us and how we live if we're not careful. Sin is primarily an inside deal. And it changes our relationship with God. It changes our relationship with other people. It changes our relationship and our power in the world. And it changes our relationship with ourselves. It's terrible. Listen, Jesus said that inside sin is relationship busting love diminishing and self-destructive we can't afford to have it we can't afford to have it inside sin will cause you eventually to do things that seriously damage your body that damage your relationships that damage your soul and may eventually send you to hell even from the seat that you sit in every single Sunday did you hear me I hope you did, because Jesus said that. Jesus said that. Jesus said that. And he is the almighty God, the creator of the world, the one who died for our redemption, and the one who will judge us in the end. And that's what he said. That's what he said. You know what? Jesus said... That inside sin is so serious that no price is too high to pay to take care of it. That's what he said. It is so serious that no sin is too high to take care of it. If Jesus were standing here in the flesh this morning, he would say, listen... 
If your eye is the trigger to sin, poke it out. If your hand is the thing that causes you to get in trouble, cut it off. Oh, you think I'm talking about self-mutilation? No, no, no. I'm just wanting to tell you how drastic the action should be that you are willing to take to take care of your sin. You need to start starving the machine that feeds and fuels your lust. You know what it is. I'm saying no action is too drastic to take care of it because even if you ended up coming to the place to say, you know what, the only way I can live in this world without lusting is poking my eyes out, then I guess I'll poke them out. Jesus is saying... You know what? Small price to pay to avoid hell. Small price to pay. You should do whatever is necessary to quit it. Jesus says this is the biggest deal. Stop feeding the machine that feeds your sin. Cut it off. Cut off the supply. Starve whatever it is that feeds it. And you know what it is. Different strokes for different folks, right? You know what it is. Some people are fueled for lust by the computer. Then by God, take care of it. You know how to do that. If you find a way around, and if your lust problem is big enough, you'll find a way around those computer locks that are on there. And so get rid of your computer. Only use it at work and only use it under under very careful conditions. You say, that's unreasonable. Everybody's got to have a computer. Yep, and lots of them are going to go to hell over it. Because they're ruining their lives. Let me see. Hell, computer. Hell, computer. I don't know. You tell me what's worth it. Maybe it's the music you listen to. Maybe it's the magazines you read. Maybe it's the places you go. But you know what fuels it. You know what fuels it. And stop it! Cut it off! Jesus says, poke your eye out. What fuels your anger? You know, I used to hang around a girl that every time I was with her, she just got me worked up because she was so discontented. You know, things were always wrong with her parents and always wrong with her husband and, you know, her boss and all this kind of stuff. And and she was always talking political junk, all of that stuff. And when I would get around her for very long, I would feel so edgy I would come home and Charlie would say, how's your day? And I'd say, terrible, terrible. What have you been doing all day? You know, that's kind of of how I felt. That's kind of how I felt. And God spoke to me so clearly. Huh, if your hand gets you in trouble, cut it off. And I cut off that friendship. Did it feel good? No. Did she misunderstand me? Yes, she wouldn't hear what I had to say. Friendship? Hell. Friendship, hell. Pretty easy decision in my book. Jesus said, starve whatever it is. If it's movies, if it's renting those things that you bring to your house, whatever it is that feeds your addiction, cut it off. Cut it off. Don't use a cell phone. Don't use the computer. Don't do those things because don't kid yourself. It's not just your marriage. It's not just your reputation. It is your eternal soul that is in danger. Jesus said it. Poke your eye out. Get rid of it. And guys, don't be so lousy and low that you say, my wife made me do it. Grow up. Get a backbone. This is what I'm doing for myself because I value my life. I value my witness. Quit it. Starve the things that make you swear. Starve the things that get you triggered to say the words you shouldn't say. It may mean changing associations. It may mean uh, changing the shows that you watch on TV because they say things and you flippantly get used to words that you should never utter from your mouth. Cut it off. Cut it off. Make it out of bounds for you. Poke your eye out. Do it. But then that's not enough. You know how it is if you're on a diet and you tell yourself, 
I will never eat a chocolate chip cookie again. I will never eat a chocolate chip cookie again. Pretty soon you're obsessed with chocolate chip cookies, right? Ask me how I know that. <laughs> you can't do that. The next thing that the Bible tells us we need to do is not just cut it off, but the place where that used to be intentionally fill with good stuff. Put good stuff in the place of what you've starved out. Put good stuff there. Philippians 4, 8 says that we are to, on purpose, think about everything that is good, everything that is pure, everything that is uplifting, everything that is holy, everything that encourages people. Those are the things we're supposed to think about. Those are the things that are supposed to fill our minds. And so I take some stuff out and I put other stuff in. I got to do that. I love to listen to music in my car and this last summer, um, and it's happened to me many, many times, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guarantee that you've had an experience close to this before as well. I'm sitting in my car, and I'm listening to wonderful music as I drive around. This, this music is so good, and, you know, I was listening. I kept listening over and over again to that beautiful song, Oh, How He Loves Us, Oh, How He Loves Us. I was listening to that, and I, I, it was just filling my heart so much, and I was so encouraged, and I had tears streaming down my cheeks, and I, I was so encouraged about God's love for me, and I just, man, I just wanted to get around people and love on them a little bit and just remind them of how much God loves them and tell them how good God is and what he does for us. I couldn't wait to do it. And then on this side of me, we were in two lanes here, on this side of me, the lane that would turn to the left, a car approached, and the music got there a long time before the car did. You know what I mean? Okay, at least I think it was music. <laughs> it was the most hostile, aggressive, da 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 that's, that's the kind of stuff that they were playing, you know. You know, all this stuff. And I'm looking over. I look over to this car over there. And these guys in the car, they look like they could eat three people at once and spit them out, you know. They're like... And then in the middle of this concert, the light changed. And the lady in front of them, somehow the poor fool, didn't realize the light had changed to like three whole seconds. <laughs> and they were blowing on the horn, leaning out the window, flipping her that amazing high sign. <laughs> and I thought, wow. Bible's true. Garbage in, garbage out. Good stuff in, good stuff out. I'd be on death row pretty soon <laughs> if I listened to that junk. <laughs> because it doesn't build you up. You know what I'm saying? And you know what doesn't build you up in your life. You know what it is. The Bible says starve that stuff. This is Jesus talking. He says starve that stuff that doesn't build you up, that doesn't give you anything good for the world. Starve that stuff and fill your stuff with good things. That's a good illustration of how we have to take responsibility for what leaks out of us into the world. Be proactive. Take care of it. Jesus said... That sin is primarily an inside deal. And that inside stuff is so significant that you should pay whatever price it takes to get rid of it, to take care of it. Wow. Do you know what? Jesus is here this morning. He is. Just as surely as he was that day so long ago on that hillside. And you know what he's saying this morning? Just as surely as he said that first day. Listen, sin is an inside deal. If your eye is getting you in trouble, figure out what your eye is and poke it out. If your hand's getting you in trouble, Figure out what your hand is and cut it off. 
Because sin is primarily and first a matter of the heart. I'm building a kingdom. I'm building a kingdom not of people who know how to look perfect. But I'm building a kingdom of people who are real to the core. And at the core, they have clean hearts and clean hands. We got lots of time this morning. Could you give Jesus five minutes? Could you give him five undistracted minutes to handle some really significant business that deals with your soul? Could you let him hold his standard up close to your heart? And don't tell yourself it's that crazy preacher. Don't tell yourself it's your annoying wife. Don't tell yourself it's your legalistic husband. Let God hold his standard up to your heart and call out to you for clean hands and clean hearts. And then take these five minutes and make a commitment to him to starving the bad, cutting it off, and filling it up with the good. Okay? You knew that? Five minutes for Jesus, for your eternity that lasts forever. You can respond however you want to. Come to the altar and pray. You can join in the singing. You can pray at your seat. You can kneel at your seat. You can do whatever. Don't kid yourself. We all got business to do. Five minutes with Jesus. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil. Sure.
There's only one part of that song I don't like, and the reason I don't like it is because um, it's actually not God's job to make us humble. The Bible tells us to humble yourself, humble yourself under God's mighty hand. Humble yourself. See, and God gives us plenty of opportunities to do that. Because if we don't humble ourselves and do what's right, God loves us so much. He doesn't want us to miss heaven. He doesn't want us to live life here in a way that dishonors him or hurts us or breaks our relationship. And so God will do many, many things. He will throw many things in our pathway to give us an opportunity to humble ourselves. God wants to do it privately. He wants to do it quietly. He wants to do it with the least hurt to you possible. But God's like a parent. He loves you so much. If you've ever come to know him as Savior, this, this is, you're not going to commit one sin and go to hell. I want you to understand that. If you've ever come to know him as Savior, he is going to pursue you. He's going to pursue you to give you an opportunity to humble yourself and get yourself in right relationship with him. And he'll give you plenty of quiet opportunities. But he's like a good parent. He's not above humiliating you if that's what it takes. Humbling by God publicly is a hard, hard thing to do. And do you know if you read the history of Israel, you read the history of God's people, he will let your enemies and your own sins be the things that humble you. Just like our sign out there says today, we are punished by our sins as much as for them. You know, your sins are going to take you to a bad place and they will punish you. Consider the priest we've all read about in the papers this week and that his story went viral on the internet. I, my heart just broke for this poor man who obviously has so much goodness in him. But listen, times he had opportunity to humble himself and get his heart right and get himself straightened out before he ended up where he was. Just a thought. Consider it. Your job is to humble yourself. My job is to humble myself under God's mighty hand so that he can lift me up. And I hope you're doing that this morning and seeking his face. Let me pray with you. Father, you've been so faithful. You've spoken to all of us. You've spoken to all of us. You've spoken to me. You've spoken to all of us about the things we need to do to take care of the inside sin that's in us. It's so easy to be stirred up when we're hearing someone talking and go away and find nothing changed. Help us to take the steps to do the work, to cut the things off that need cut off, and to put into our life what needs into our life. We ask it in the powerful name of Jesus, who is our strength, who is our Savior, and who also is our judge. Amen. 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 Thank you for your great attention this morning. I'm going to ask the ushers to come, give us an opportunity to give our tithes and gifts to the Lord. And if you're watching by way of the web, boy, are we grateful for you. We're so glad that um, you are watching with us. There's a place for you to give. Click to donate as well. Hey, I just got a note here when we were praying is that our friend is okay. She had some heart and sugar issues, but she's uh, feeling better, and they're following up with the doctor. Praise the Lord. Let's thank Jesus for that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We thank the Lord for that. Another thing I want to share with you is that next Sunday, uh, the thing that we can't believe that Jesus said is, I can't hear you over that grudge you're carrying. And I'm sure all of us could benefit from that as well. We hope you'll be back for that. Immediately after service today, Pastor Jeff will be right up here. We're so excited about the men we have in our church family, and we want to give them every opportunity to lead well. And uh, if you're a guy, no ladies can go, but if you're a guy, you can meet over here in the huddle. Five minutes, promise. No more than that with Pastor Jeff. He will give you a little tool and an idea for engaging uh, the people that you love in spiritual conversation this week. It'll be great stuff. We hope that you'll participate in that. And the other thing is, cold day. Wasn't that a bummer to wake up and find this snow? Woo! Okay, well, we have a way to make up for it. Hand is selling chili to go. You can grab it and eat it in the cafe if you'd like or take it home with you, but all the benefits, uh, all the proceeds will benefit our hand organization that helps the needy. Would you stand with me, please, and receive the blessing of the Lord? May Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for you and who wants to give you the power to live faithfully for him, receive your most highest obedience this day and every day until that great day, we joyfully welcome him as our judge. Amen.